Night Bulletin presents The Paperback Recycler, written and read by T.F. Ahmed. 1. Sherman Hashim was many things. He was a bachelor, an American of half-Indian and half-German descent, and an amateur inventor. Most of all, Sherman Hashim was a writer. S.H. Ward, as his book so proudly asserted, was a writer of fantastical fiction. Growing up, he read Jules Verne, H. Ryder Haggard, and the tales of Russian novelist P. V. Roshenko. Following these traditions, Hashim wrote tales of seafaring men plucked from farms as boys to fulfill prophecies of old. He wrote tales of fair maidens transported to other realms through a portal in their backyards. He was even known to pen a tale or two about a magical fox who could talk. He was hoping this last would become an epic tetralogy. There was a small problem, however, with the prolific S.H. Ward and his fantastical novels. They were rather dull in a market full of fantastical tales told by better and more charming writers than he. Sherman Hashim would collect the newspaper daily and religiously read the literature section. He subscribed to 11 of the most popular literary review journals in the nation. He read every review of his contemporaries' work, noting who was met with more praise than criticism. Whenever one of his own novels graced the pages of one of these journals, Hashim would read as critics tore apart his lazy prose and abnormal pacing and inability to get past genre conventions. He would quickly sink into melancholy. The only way out of this melancholy was a quick trip to the Fromagerie, where he would purchase several hundred dollars worth of fine cheese from Gustav, the Fromager. He would consume this cheese with crackers and beer steadily over the next few days. Slowly, the cheese knife would be replaced by a pen, and he would start writing again. If Hashim was one thing, he was productive. He wrote at least four days a week in two-hour shifts, taking numerous breaks to catch up on his correspondence, exercise, or tinker in his lab. At this rate, Sherman completed a manuscript of 100,000 words, edited it twice, and had it sent off to his agent in less than six months. He spent the last few months working in his lab and reading reviews for the novel he had written the previous year. This, as you already know, led him down a path of dairy destruction. Despite these poor reviews, S.H. Ward novels sold steadily. Harkman Press, Ward's publisher, never mentioned the poor reviews of his work, focusing solely on the various graphs and charts showing how much money they were making. The only person other than Hashim who seemed to care about the reviews was his agent, Rick R. Mortis. I really think you should try it, Rick had said at their last meeting. He had been trying to get Hashim to sign up for an intensive writing workshop in Alaska. I've already told you, Hashim muttered, I don't need it. He, in fact, did need it. He simply hated the idea of Alaska. Well, at least look at the brochure. Rick slid a glossy trifold with the words, The Moose Haven Writer's Retreat, a 12-week intensive writer's boot camp, on the front. Hashim sighed. You can't put the words retreat and boot camp in the same title, he said. Seems a bit... muddled. Muddled? Rick did not seem to understand. Nevertheless, the literary agent continued, you have to start producing higher quality fiction. He stood up and began pacing the room. Take Ezra Bloodhound. Hashim groaned. Not Ezra Bloodhound... Mr. Bloodhound was a lawyer-turned-author who had found success writing a highly popular series of novels about a lawyer named Herbert Baversham, who made his living representing supernatural creatures. The most recent installment had Baversham defending a yeti's right to self-defense in his eating of a hiker who had trespassed on his land. Hashim had read it, of course. It was excellent. It was so good, in fact, that the New York Times published an op-ed about how Bloodhound was paving the way for genre fiction to be taken as serious literature. Who knew, Rick continued, ignoring Hashim's groan, that taking depositions and drafting legal notices would translate into a remarkable skill in literature. Who knew, indeed, Hashim said tiredly. 2. Sherman Hashim was not a man who wanted for money. He was independently wealthy thanks to several fatal coincidences. His father was a wealthy meatpacker who specialized in hogs and poultry. When he passed away at age 57, he left his massive fortune to his wife, Hashim's doting mother. Hashim had been left a trust by his father that he drew upon almost instantly, Hashim being 17 when his father passed. Six years later, 
Mrs. Hashim passed away in her sleep, leaving the remaining estate to her only child. At this point, Hashim had already finished his structural engineering degree at the University of Chicago and was working at his uncle's architecture firm. When one of the buildings he had signed off on collapsed, he was stripped of his engineering license and started working at a bar. It was at this point he began writing. His uncle passed away four years later and left a substantial sum to Hashim. He never knew why his uncle did so, but he assumed it was out of pity. He used this newfound wealth to buy a house in Old Town and build a laboratory in his basement. He quit his job as a bartender and became a tinkerer and writer full-time. He wrote his first novel, A Plague of Broken Wings, in three months and sent it off. It was published the following year. He still had not invented anything useful. 3. H.R. Ward's latest novel, The Warlock, The Fox, and The Fancy Corset, was criticized for being utterly derivative and a shameful portrayal of feminine agency. It was his 13th novel, and the reviews started to blend together. True to form, Hashim went to his fromagerie, spent most of his first royalty check on various fine cheeses, and locked himself in his mansion, consuming more fermented cow's milk than a normal man should. He also mail-ordered a large crate of Goldilocks farmhouse ale to consume at his leisure. After a two-month binge that saw more negative reviews and ever-diminishing royalty checks, Hashim had collected quite a collection of wax paper, hollow cracker tins, and empty beer bottles. He collected the detritus of his melancholy and placed it in a large crate. He picked up the phone and dialed the Cooley Brothers Recycling Center. For a nominal fee, they would drive a truck to your house and haul away any and all recyclables you had accumulated. For a man without a car like Hashim, such a service was vital. On this particular pickup, Hashim waited outside with his crate of recyclables and covered up his mouth with a handkerchief so he would not inhale the exhaust of the approaching Cooley Brothers truck. John Cooley, the elder of the Cooley Brothers, stepped out of his truck and approached Hashim. Good day to you, he said politely. Good day to you too, Hashim responded. Is this it? John asked, hooking his thumb towards the crate. Yes, yes, Hashim said. This is it. He gave an ineffectual tap to the crate with the flat of his palm. John nodded and opened the double doors on the back of his truck. He began to leverage the crate into the truck with a complex pulley system that made the inventor part of Hashim's brain whistle with joy. After a short minute, the crate sat securely in the back of the truck. Hashim approached the man and handed him the amount of the bill. It was at this moment that the inventor part of Hashim's brain lit up again. He turned to John Cooley and leveled him with a curious stare. "'Excuse me, John,' he asked in a strange casualness. "'Yes?' "'What is it that you do with all of the recycling?' "'Well, we recycle it,' John made to enter the truck. "'But what happens to it after that?' Hashim insisted. "'Well, it gets reconstituted.' "'Reconstituted?' "'Yes, reconstituted. "'Like all those cracker tins will get melted down and turned into different tins of all kinds.' Is that so? Certainly is. Circle of life and all that. And with a large spit on the pavement, John entered his truck and drove off. Reconstituted, Hashim said, entering his house with a grin. 4. Instead of writing, Hashim spent the next few weeks in his lab. When he was not in his lab, he was out gathering parts and acquiring tools. Many of the parts and tools he required were not available in stores or in mail-order catalogs. For these items, Hashim had to use his inventor connections. He would make a few calls and then meet someone in a desolate warehouse or far-flung suburban estate. The inventor's large bank account and an intrepid will made sure that the items were correct, arrived promptly, and were of the highest quality. After many late nights and passionate failures, Hashim completed all of the various components and units of his latest invention. He hoisted the pieces up the stairs and into his study. He moved several bookshelves and scooted his desk away from the wall, clearing ample floor space. He then spent the next two days assembling the large machine before covering it in several sheets. The next day, Hashim sternly guarded his invention as several workmen erected a wall in front of the machine. It was blocked off completely from the rest of the study, save for a door. When the workers inevitably asked what was under the sheets, the author simply shook his head. Mother left behind a lot of old, ugly things when she passed away. I didn't have the heart to throw them out, but decided I could store them away for minimal expense. The men seemed to accept this explanation. After the men left, Hashim made a few tweaks to his machine, cut out a slot in the wall, and installed a heavy lock to the door. He pushed his desk up against his new wall, 
carefully placing the slot right above the center of the desktop. After some last-minute tidying up, Hashim wiped his brow and went to change into more appropriate attire. He was going shopping. 5. The Bookhaven was Hashim's favorite used bookstore in the city. He would make weekly trips, trading in books he no longer wanted for books he had not read before. Sometimes, he would buy rare leather-bound volumes for astonishing prices, leaving the proprietor aghast and grateful. Today's trip, however, was going to be different. Upon entering the shop, the light tinkle of a bell announced his arrival. Millpond, the bookshop proprietor, looked up from the old, dusty novel he was reading and pushed his glasses up on his head. "'Oh, Mr. Hashim!' he exclaimed, standing up slowly from his chair that seemed to be from a different epoch. "'Good to see you again!' Hashim grunted in the bookshop owner's direction and headed straight for the section of the store that contained massive bins of bargain paperbacks. These bins were, in fact, repurposed whiskey barrels. Like a game of grab bag, one could reach in and dig for hours only to come up with one novel in decent enough condition to read. Hashim bent over the bins and examined their contents like a man perusing cuts of meat at the butcher shop. He sniffed disagreeably at the first bin, finding it to be full of dull romances. The second bin was science fiction of the variety found in old pulp magazines. The third bin was full of penny dreadfuls. The fourth was filled with fantasy fiction of the kind H.R. Ward wrote. Hashim picked two slim paperbacks at random from each of the bins except the first and walked his six books to the front counter. Millpond eagerly opened his ledger and pulled his pencil from behind his ear. Is this all you'll be purchasing today, Mr. Hashim? His voice was exceedingly polite but Hashim knew the proprietor was slightly disappointed at his meager haul. Hashim waved his hand. Not at all, my good man. I am simply placing these here while I shop around. Melpon smiled and replaced his pencil. Please, he said. Proceed. With a nod, the author turned back to the shelves and set his sight on any paperback he could find. Forty-five minutes later, Hashim exited the bookhaven with three large brown paper bags full to bursting with books. They were so heavy that he was forced to hail a cab back to his house. Millpon's eyes had turned to the shape of saucers when he saw how many books the author was buying. Going on a sea voyage, are we? He had asked. A sea voyage? Hashim had asked, confused. Oh yes, Millpon answered with an exaggerated nod. Only time I've ever seen people buy this many books was for a long voyage. I'm not going on a voyage, Hashim answered with boredom. I am simply stocking up on titles. It is getting harder and harder to make the trip out here with how busy I am these days. This answer had been enough for the bookshop owner. In fact, Millpond was at a loss for words when he finally calculated the total of Hashim's purchase. His mouth remained open, his jaw slack, as Hashim counted out the bills and placed them on the counter. It was the single biggest purchase anyone had ever made in the book haven. Millpond closed the shop after Hashim left. He greedily counted the money and placed it in his safe. He then went to the nearest public house and spent the rest of the evening loudly praising the work of S.H. Ward, an author he never actually read. 6. Hashim carried his purchases up to his office and laid them neatly on the floor. He had bought 24 books of varying sizes and lengths, all paperbacks. He grabbed six random titles and carried them to his desk. Opening the lock on the large door, he stepped into the room housing his invention. The room was very warm, the equipment buzzing and chittering lightly. He checked the moving parts for sufficient lubrication and tested all of the components. He ran his eyes along the machine, looking for any imperfections or damage. When he was satisfied, he placed each of the six paperbacks on a flat surface at one end of the machine. The books lay end to end like they were on an assembly line. Hashim then walked over to the control panel and fiddled with switches and dials. When the settings were to his liking, he pressed a large green button. The machine whirled to life. The room was suddenly filled with a cacophonous chorus of moving machinery. The books on the conveyor belt slowly rolled forward into the belly of the machine. Hashim wiped the sweat accumulating on his brow and waited breathlessly. After he saw the last paperback disappear into his machine, he exited the small room and padlocked the door. If his calculations were correct, it would take six hours for the process to be completed. He checked his watch. Barely 9 p.m. No matter, he thought. Best to get some rest now. The author and inventor took one final look around his office before heading to bed. It had been a long day. 
7. Hashim was awakened by a loud ringing coming from his office. He rose groggily and stared at his watch. It was 3 in the morning. With a slowness common with men who ate too much cheese, he put on his robe and padded to his office. The ringing was louder here, but he was sure none of the neighbors would be awoken by it. He had calibrated the sound so he could hear it in any room of the large house. He entered the machine room and made his way to the control panel where he pressed a large red button. The ringing ceased. There was a whoosh followed by a flat thud. With glee, Hashem stepped back into his office and looked on his desk. Underneath the slot in the large wall lay a large stack of paper clipped together at the top. With delicate reverence, Hashem lifted the stack and read the words printed on the front. The Secret Adventure of Jonathan Trek by S.H. Ward Hashim's intake of breath was so sharp he coughed. It had worked. By God, it had worked. The author was suddenly wide awake. He clutched the manuscript in his hands and ran down the stairs to his kitchen. He brewed a pot of coffee and sat at the kitchen table, drinking cup after cup of the strong black brew while he read the stack of pages in front of him. The novel concerned the double life led by an English aristocrat named Jonathan Track. By day, he was a mild-mannered tax accountant in a country town. By night, he was an amateur archaeologist, researching undiscovered portions of the world. He would travel to unknown locales and have daring adventures in the ruins of ancient cities. There was action, there was romance, but the manuscript was essentially like any other S.H. Ward novel. Hashim finished the manuscript a few hours later. He hadn't moved from his perch at the kitchen table in this time, save to make two more pots of coffee. His stomach growled at the lack of food, and his face felt heavy at the lack of sleep. At first... His excitement had been enough to keep him awake. By the time he had finished the manuscript, he felt as if he'd run across the city. The novel was good, there was no doubt, but it wasn't great. It was just like something he would write on his own. Granted, this manuscript took six hours to produce rather than six months, but the end result was the same. This melancholy, however, was only temporary. The manuscript in his hands, mediocre though it may be, was proof that his invention had worked. He had finally built something that worked. With his renewed sense of accomplishment, Hashim returned to his study. This time, he picked ten of the best paperbacks he could find in his pile. He placed them on the conveyor belt and pressed the necessary buttons. Six hours later, he pulled the still warm manuscript off his desk and read it all the way through. By the end, Hashim was in tears. It was not only the greatest novel to ever bear his name, it was also the single greatest novel he'd ever read. No editing was required. The plot, the characters, the prose, the themes, all perfect. He rang his agent. Rick, he said, his voice containing uncharacteristic enthusiasm. Uh, huh? Came a stuttered reply. Rick, it's me, Hashim. Oh, oh, exclaimed the literary agent. How do you do, Mr. Hashim? Making progress on your next manuscript? Yes, in fact, Hashim replied. I would actually like to show it to you. I think I've hit on something spectacular. His enthusiasm was contagious. Bring it on over then, Rick said, now excited as well. I can't wait to read it. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. sharp, the author assured. 10 it is. Good day. When he replaced his phone in the cradle, Hashim realized something critical. It had only been a few weeks since his last contact with his agent. In no way would he believe that Hashim had wrote this masterpiece in that amount of time. Thinking quickly, he grabbed the first two chapters only. He placed the slim stack of pages into his leather satchel and set it by his front door. He could barely contain his excitement. He spent the rest of the day rearranging his massive home library. 8. This is magnificent! Rick slapped the stack of sample chapters on his desk with a child's reckless enthusiasm. Hashim winced chiding himself for not making a copy of these chapters before arriving. "'What's that look on your face?' Rick asked, suddenly worried. Hashim gently took the stack of pages off his agent's desk. "'This is my only copy. Best we keep it whole.' "'Oh.' Rick placed his hands in his lap like a boy caught stealing sweets. "'Nevertheless,' the agent said. "'Brilliant work there, my friend. Brilliant work.' Hashim smiled as he latched his case shut and sat up straight. "'I believe it to be among my best work.' Among your best work, Rick said. It is your best work. Hands down the greatest opening to a novel since P.V. Roshenko's masterful classic. Help, I'm in jail. Hashim gawked. 
He knew his work was great, but to be compared to such a master, it was hardly believable. Rick smiled at the author's expression, but then grew serious. I'm going to be frank, he said. I was beginning to lose faith in you. Hashim said nothing. Thirteen novels, Rick continued, all steady sellers. But still, not one rising above the other, or rising to the top of their genre. I was seriously beginning to lose faith. I thought we would both languish in obscurity, forgotten in the annals of the history of literature, stuck in the backs of libraries, thrown into bargain bins at the used bookstore. I see, Hashim said evenly, bringing Rick's imaginings to a halt. There was a silence for a stretch. The author looked out the window of his agent's office, watching the trees sway in the light morning breeze. Their colors seemed remarkably green for such a day, as if they had been hand-painted by God himself. Lost in this reverie, he did not hear his name being called until the third time. Hashim! Yes, he said, tearing his face away from the window. When can I have the rest of the novel? Hashim thought about this for a beat. I'm feeling rather inspired lately, he said with a smile. How about in four weeks? 9. Hashim spent the next few weeks in a state of leisure. He woke up late, spent the long mornings in his nightclothes, and cooked elaborate breakfasts. He would eat these meals sitting in his sunroom with pot after pot of slow-brewed coffee. He would go for walks around his neighborhood and spend his evenings reading in his library. He would periodically pass his desk and pick up the manuscript. Flipping through the pages, he would read random passages and caress the paper. He would do this several times a day, as if fearing the manuscript would disappear. There were moments when Hashim felt guilty about his use of the machine, his machine that recycled paperbacks and turned them into new novels. It had created something in six hours that he could not have made in six years. He was under no impression that he had written the novel, but that did not mean that he did not create it. The machine was the word processor, and the careful selection of paperbacks was his fingers dancing across the keys. Yes, he was definitely the creator of this work of art. No Hashim, no novel. Two weeks later, his paranoia came to a head, and he spent the rest of the week meticulously copying the manuscript word for word on his typewriter. He did not feel comfortable having only one copy. This act alleviated another anxiety as well. Now that he had typed out the manuscript, it felt more his. When the four-week deadline ended, Hashim sent the manuscript he had copied on his typewriter. It felt like the right thing to do. 10. A Masterpiece a look at S.H. Ward's new novel, The Queen in Her Study. New York Times Book Review. Is S.H. Ward the American P.V. Roshenko? The Chicago Literature Review, issue 626. This just in, local author S.H. Ward's new novel, The Queen in Her Study, sells out at all local bookstores. Local Booksellers Journal. 11. This could be marked as the beginning of the career of S.H. Ward. The Queen in her study was rushed to print after Rick Mortis read the manuscript and passed it on to Ward's publisher. The editor could find no flaw in the text and was rumored to be seen roaming the halls of the publisher's office, weeping. The first print run of 5,000 copies sold out in mere minutes thanks to the pre-release review of the novel by the New York Times. Another print run of 5,000 sold out in two days. The publishing company began ordering an obscene amount of copies, trying their best to keep up with demand. S.H. Ward became a household name. The author, Ever the Recluse, began to be noticed on the street. He appeared to dislike this kind of attention, even if it was positive. That did not stop him from attending several speaking engagements for large sums of money. When the author's already wealthy status was found out by the public, he started donating his speaking fees to public libraries. The key to creating the best work of fiction is a keen scientific mind, the author was quoted as saying. No one was quite sure what this meant, but they applauded all the same. The only man in all of Chicago who seemed to frown at the author's success was a proprietor of the local fromagerie. 12. This novel needs a sequel, Rick said, pacing his office. He blew out smoke from a gilded cigar, heedless of its direction. Hashim waved the smoke away with an ungloved hand and coughed. I'm not sure that's a good idea, he said. Rick stopped pacing and stared at his star client. Why not? Hashim wasn't sure how to answer that question. He was unsure if his machine could make sequels, and he did not want to tarnish his masterpiece with a poorly penned second volume. 
I'm quite sure I've done all I can with Queen Amalia's story, the author answered. Ridiculous. People want to know what happens next. They want to know if Amalia ever gets to leave her self-imposed prison. They want to know if she will ever see her children again. By God, Hashim, they want to know if the evil King Redul carries out his poisoning plot. Don't you think your readers deserve to know that? Rick ended his impassioned speech with another large puff of his cigar. Again, Hashim waved his hand and coughed. My readers, as you say, don't deserve anything, really. Hashim had wanted to say that aloud for so long. The end of the novel is meant to be ambiguous. It is meant to linger in the reader's mind, to keep him up at night wondering at the character's fates. But still, Rick persisted, why can't the sequel go in a different direction entirely? Hashim lifted his hand and extended an index finger. One, I don't want to write a sequel. He extended his second finger. And two, since when did you start smoking cigars? Rick coughed during this last question. He eyed his cigar as if he was unsure how it got into his hand. The dim office light glinted off the gold foil, its lit end curling with disappearing smoke into the air. I've always smoked cigars, Rick said. I just could never afford them before. Oh, come off it, Hashim said. You've only bought those because they're expensive. Same with that suit. Rick was, in fact, wearing an expensively tailored suit. He looked like a mouse that had won the lottery. Rick placed the cigar back in his mouth and resumed his pacing. Thanks to your massive sales figures, I can finally afford the finer things in life. Yes, Hashim said flatly. The finer things. Yes. Now about that sequel, Hashim sighed. 13. The author was able to dissuade his agent from the idea of a sequel to The Queen in her study and promised him a new manuscript in six weeks. Hashim started his new novel the same way he started his previous one, with a trip to the bookstore. This time, however, he found the selection at the book haven lacking. He had used a menagerie of good books to create his masterpiece. If he wanted something better, he needed to look elsewhere. The Map Room was a rare book and map store located in Hyde Park. Hashim took a long cab ride down to this bookstore one afternoon at precisely 2 o'clock. This was the sort of place that only took appointments and only allowed individuals with a certain amount of disposable income to enter. Hashim entered the brownstone with the aid of a doorman. He was ushered into a lavish room lined with glass-fronted bookshelves and elaborate display cases all under lock and key. A large oak table sat in the mathematical center of the space. The room looked every bit the museum, save for the large high-top desk at the back. Behind this desk sat a small balding man with a pair of spectacles on the bridge of his nose, poring over a ledger. He looked up at Hashim as he walked in. Ah, the famous S.H. Ward. How can I help you? The old man stepped from behind the table. He approached the author slowly on two short legs, and it was then that Hashim realized he had been standing on a platform behind his high-top desk. How are you, sir? Hashim asked, not sure if looking down at the man was offensive. What are you in the market for? the proprietor asked. Well, Hashim said smiling, I'm looking for the best you've got. 14. S.H. Ward's second novel produced with his machine was titled The Red. Such a simple title as this from the habitually wordy Ward was a mystery that surrounded the work until its highly anticipated release. Reviews for this novel were glowing, and Hashim found himself more famous than ever before. For a bachelor who loved his solitude, this was one of the downsides of fame. He began stepping out of doors less, pacing his immense mansion instead of taking walks around the neighborhood. His trips to bookstores became less frequent, and he turned to mail-ordering his books. He hired a private driver to pick up his groceries. More often than not, he had meetings with Rick at his home in a special office on the ground floor built for this purpose. Some people tried to penetrate this private exterior of the elusive author. His seclusion only heightened his allure in the public's eye. On more than one occasion, the famous novelist had to call the police on fans who had no sense of propriety or private property. Several newspapers and reporters trying to gain access into the magnificent inner sanctum of the author by proposing in-home interviews for ludicrous sums of money. Hashim refused all of these. Any interviews were done exclusively by phone, and even these were very rare. Hashim was making more money than he ever had before. He rarely used this money, as his expenses were low and his needs few. 
If one were to look at his personal ledger, they would perhaps be a bit surprised at just how much he spent on rare and obscure books. Though it may not be unusual for a writer to own books, the strangeness of the situation would only be made apparent when one looked at Hashim's curiously sparse library. For if Hashim truly spent as much on his books as his financial records indicated, then where were all the books? The answer, of course, was that they were fed to the machine. Hashim the inventor spent most of his idle hours tinkering with the machine, replacing parts, oiling the dry joints. He would feed books to the machine constantly, producing large manuscripts, one after another. He would read these in his kitchen, making small corrections, for now he had deluded himself into thinking he was a far better writer now that he was famous, before laboriously typing the manuscript out on his beloved typewriter, a pantomime of a real author. For years, Hashim followed this pattern. He produced so many manuscripts that he began to release two or three books a year, sometimes under a pseudonym. His bank account grew, but so did his fame, and so did his seclusion. He spent some of his fortune on erecting a higher fence around his property. He also covered most of his windows with frosted glass at considerable expense. Rick remained his agent, and pretty soon, his only link to the outside world. The public devoured every S.H. Ward novel that came out. Reviews were almost always glowing, with some outliers never having a taste for the esoteric genres he published in. Ward's publisher, Harkman Press, routinely sent lavish gifts to their cash cow and tried several times to hold events in honor of the author. He always failed to show up. This pattern of behavior continued for almost a decade. In this time, Hashim had published 28 additional novels after the invention of his machine. One day, however, there was a shock to the world. On the front page of the Chicago Tribune in big, black, bold letters was the headline, Famous novelist S.H. Ward announces retirement, palatial old town compound to be sold. It seemed the writer had finally had enough of his fame. 15. What do you think you're doing? Rick's voice was indignant. He was clutching the morning edition of the Chicago Tribune in his hand, his various gold rings glistening in the noonday sun that slipped in from slits in the drapes. You didn't think to inform me of this? He held the newspaper out like a cursed object. They were in Hashim's home in the ground floor office. It was a bare room with an ancient pitted wooden desk flanked by two hard easy chairs. The walls were bare save for a framed photograph of Rick and Hashim smiling at the book release party for The Red. It was one of the last public appearances the author made. Hashim, seated in one of the uncomfortable easy chairs, spoke without looking at Rick. I did not think it wise to inform you beforehand. Before the irate literary agent could interject, Hashim continued speaking. If I made my intentions known to anyone, even you, I would never hear the end of it. Now that the public knows, there are no longer any more expectations of me. He turned to Rick. I am done with this profession. I am done with this city. There was a heavy silence in the room, save for the occasional frustrated breathing of Rick. Both faces were unreadable, but if Hashim were a gambling man, he would rager that Rick's brain was like a speeding train, struggling to think of a way to make his golden goose lay more eggs. Rick had grown immensely wealthy from S.H. Ward's body of work. Though the agent had reduced his percentage over the years, his commission had always remained high. Rick, like Hashim, had remained a bachelor all his life, but unlike Hashim, he had a difficult time holding on to money once he got it. He owned three homes, one in Chicago, one in Lake Bluff, and one in San Juan. He had spent many hours perusing catalogs and thousands of dollars on furnishings for these homes. He wore the best clothing, his bathrobes costing more than the average man's best church suit. He wore fine gold jewelry on his fingers, wrists, and around his neck. He smoked two cigars a day, always ordering ones wrapped in gold leaf. He was a member of two gentlemen's clubs with monthly dues more than a factory foreman's annual salary. He would not let Hashim retire quietly. I know what you're thinking, Hashim said, catching Rick by surprise. But my back catalog should continue to sell well, earning us both substantial paychecks. He said this last sentence with a lack of delight, for money had become all but meaningless to the wealthy author. But if you don't keep producing new work, Rick countered, interest in you will wane, and one day you will be forgotten. Hashim shook his head. He knew he would never be forgotten, not with the body of work he had produced. He knew Rick was grasping at straws. I'm in debt, you know, the literary agent said quietly. 
He idly twirled one of his gold rings around his finger as if he were playing with a magical totem. Hashim said nothing, his face a blank mask of uncaring. I've had to sell all my houses, Rick continued. I'm now living in an apartment. He let out a hoarse laugh. <sighs> and yet, I still owe money to my creditors. I make regular payments, but my reserves are running low. He removed the ring he had been playing with and tossed it up in the air, catching it deftly. After I leave here, these are going to be sold next. Hashim still said nothing. Rick's calm broke. Don't you see, he implored, I need you to publish another novel, at least one more. Please. Hashim looked up at his agent. I wish I could, but I cannot. I have lost all steam. Rick placed his ring back on his finger with an exaggerated slowness. He gazed at his fingers, then made a fist as if readying himself to strike Hashim's jaw. But after a few tense seconds, he relaxed his fingers and opened his hand. Guess I cannot stop you from retiring, Rick said, making for the door. But my request still stands. Please publish one more novel. That's all I ask. And with that, he was gone. 16. Hashim sat alone in his ground floor office, appreciating the silent void Rick left behind. He found himself sitting in utter silence more and more these days, his mind in absolute blank. He watched the dust particles dance to their mute dance in a patch of sunlight. He counted his breaths and drummed his fingers lightly on his thighs. He stood up, grunting with the effort. Being a recluse had wreaked havoc on his weight, chiefly because he never walked more than he needed to anymore. Getting from one room to another seemed to be the only thing that mattered. He walked up the stairs, stopping every few steps to catch his breath. He felt like a man scaling a mountain. Hashim stepped into his machine room and admired his invention. The room smelled of oil and old books, two distinct smells that signified the man's choices in profession. He had thought of this machine in various capacities over the years. He had thought of it as a marvelous contraption, a work of art, a revolution. He had also thought of it as a cheat, a curse, the death of human creation, the unceasing march of an uncaring and dismal future. He had contemplated destroying the machine or lovingly taking it apart. He had never once given thought to duplicating it or selling it. He had, in fact, destroyed the plans five years ago without any remorse. He closed the door on his creation and headed into the office. He guessed he would have to dismantle the machine when he sold his home. Hashim approached a trunk placed beneath the attic office's only window. He produced a key from his shirt pocket and unlocked the trunk. Inside, stacked in neat piles, were dozens of unpublished manuscripts. All were from the machine. Hashim could not precisely pinpoint the reason he kept the manuscripts. They were his, but not his. They bore his name, but not his artistic touch, his creative punch, or the mark of his soul. He had contemplated destroying them many times, but something always stopped him. Either way, he could not publish them. He felt he had been a fraud for long enough. A thought occurred to him, unbidden and unprompted. He gathered every unpublished manuscript he had and made his way to his machine room. Once inside, he fired up the machine. It started with a cough and sputter, like an old locomotive that had been left in a rail yard during a harsh winter. He grabbed a hammer and hit a few key spots on the machine until the sputtering turned into a low hum. As the conveyor belt began to move, he gingerly placed his manuscripts down one by one. He watched the machine gobble them up like a hungry beast. He did not know why he was doing this. Maybe he was just curious. One last literary experiment before he retired the machine for good. Hashim furrowed his brow. Something was wrong. The machine's pitch began to get higher, its hum creeping at the edges of a squeal. A misty smoke began to emanate from the space where the manuscripts entered the bowels of the machine. The author stepped forward just as the final manuscript titled Shakespeare vs. Lord Byron jammed halfway in the opening. The machine keened like a hurt puppy and Hashim grabbed a crowbar. He had never dealt with a paper jam in his machine before. He inserted the crowbar into the space, hammering it in as far as it would go. He then put his entire body weight down on the bar, wedging the opening wider. It moved barely a quarter inch, the manuscript sliding in only another inch or two. The author climbed upon the machine, straddling the conveyor belt so he would not slip. Blasted thing, he exclaimed as he pressed down on the crowbar again. This position was more effective, and the gap widened further. The thick manuscript slid in barely another inch, its title page bending and tearing with every movement. 
With a final desperate effort, Hashim jumped, using his considerable weight to push the crowbar down. This did the trick. There was a loud crunch and a snap, and the gap widened to a gaping maw as the plate covering the machine's inner working snapped off. The manuscript sprinted down the conveyor belt, but that wasn't the last ingredient the machine accepted. The metal plate that snapped off the machine flew through the air, striking Hashim in the forehead. A bright pain distorted all vision and caused him to lose his footing. He slipped from his post, dropping the crowbar on the floor with a clatter. The author-turned-inventor turned best-selling paperback recycler only had a brief moment of panic before he was sucked into his machine feet first. Owing to the secrecy surrounding this machine, the entire house was soundproof. No one heard the author's screams. S.H. Ward, nay Sherman Hashim, left behind no body. He did not depart this world selfishly, however. As the machine hummed and coughed and squeaked and chortled, it took all of its contents and reconstituted them into something magnificent. With a ding, a thick stack of paper exited the wall slot and landed with a plop onto the desk. 17. Rick Mortis took a small sip of whiskey out of the bottle at his desk. He wiped his mouth and picked up the newspaper before him. Even though he had just purchased this newspaper less than five minutes ago from a newsboy, he already had an idea what the front page would say. Famed author S. H. Ward has vanished, leaving behind final mysterious manuscript. Rick read on. It is this humble reporter's sad duty to inform the public that acclaimed writer S. H. Ward has been officially reported missing. The reclusive writer of fantastical tales, whose most recent novel was The Tale of the Two Hyperactive Princesses, stirred the hearts and minds of millions of readers. The author was reported missing by his literary agent Richard R. Mortis. Mr. Mortis says that he was checking on his client and became concerned when the man did not answer the door. He was able to gain entry through an unlocked window and said he found the house empty with no sign of S.H. Ward. Curiously, Mr. Mortis says he happened upon a completed manuscript in the author's study and is in the process of having it published. This seems to be at odds with the author's previous statement announcing his retirement. It is this reporter's opinion? Rick threw the newspaper aside and looked at the manuscript before him. He had read it already, of course and it was brilliant. Titled All of Me and Then Some, it was a tragedy of sorts, documenting the rise and fall of a dictator who was at heart a decent man. His position as his nation's leader causes him to be complicit in all sorts of atrocities, and eventually leads to a coup. With a dash of Ward's characteristic magic and solid prose, Rick knew this novel would become an instant classic. The news of Hashim's disappearance would only increase his legendary status. It would make Rick a lot of money. It really was a head-scratcher, though. When Rick had gained entry into Hashim's home, he had not expected to find the entire edifice empty. He searched the house from bottom to top and found no trace of the stubborn author. When he entered Hashim's study, a place he had never set foot, he was shocked by what he found. The room had the appearance of being ransacked. Books lay in piles all over the floor as if categorized for some unknown purpose. The shelves stood mostly empty, the once impressive book collection of Sherman Hashim now like an emaciated corpse. But that was nothing compared to what was in the room behind the author's desk. The door was slightly ajar, and the glint of metal and smell of oil drew the literary agent to explore. Though he was no expert in machinery, he was able to extrapolate what the machine was for. The empty bookshelves made more sense now, as did the placement of the writing desk. So this is how you do it. Rick said as he exited the machine room and approached the desk. He had always wondered how Hashim had one day walked in with a perfect novel when the rest of his work was subpar. It seemed unbelievable until Hashim began producing amazing novel after amazing novel year after year. At that point, it could hardly have been a fluke. Rick sat at the writer's desk and began reading All of Me and Then Some. He did not stand up until he had completed the tome. When he finally did stand, he almost fainted. Not only had he been sitting far too long, he also could barely contain the euphoria that came with reading such a novel. It was not only the best thing he had ever read, he doubted anyone would ever write anything better. Maybe Hashim had known this, and that's why he had retired from writing. But that still did not explain where he was. The house looked as if it had been abandoned, and surely Hashim would not have left this machine for just anybody to find. Had he meant for Rick to find it? He snatched up the manuscript. He turned it over in his hands as if he were a starving man who had just stumbled upon a whole cooked Christmas ham. No one could find out how Hashim made his novels. 
It took Rick almost an entire day, but he was able to take apart the complex machinery piece by piece and have it moved to a storage unit. It would definitely come in handy later on. He pushed the desk to a different wall and placed a waste basket underneath the slot in the wall. Anybody who saw this tableau would just think Hashim had been an eccentric writer with odd habits. Only when he was done with this rearrangement did Rick call the police. No one ever found what happened to Sherman Hashim, a.k.a. S.H. Ward. When All of Me and Then Some was finally published, it went on to win many, many awards. That was The Paperback Recycler. Please rate, review, subscribe, and tell a friend about this podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Night Bulletin.